Hello, we're glad to join you again this morning, as well as we've been glad you could join us today on Sunrise Daily. Good morning. Welcome to the program. I'm Chamberlain So. Good morning. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. It's just about three weeks to the elections. I hope you're counting down as we are. Good morning and welcome. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Just so you know, today is February 3, 2023. <laughs> Amaya Makinde, good morning and welcome. <laughs> I, I don't know why the timekeeper never fails to get me every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, timekeeper. Okay, Mr. Timekeeper, we hear you. We hear you. And I hope all of those who are having some challenge or the other to pick up their permanent voter card, just do what you can while you can. I know there's been several back and forth. Uh, Professor Tommy was at the Lagos office yes, last time. Anne Greg in Lagos also did say he was shocked, disappointed. He was going to report Professor Tommy that he couldn't be right about what he's saying. They did doing their bit to ensure that everyone gets their PVCs on the one hand. But then, while we keep an eye on that and across the country as well, we kind of just highlight, unfortunately, three people have been killed as a building collapsed in Abuja. You'd have thought that, oh, boy. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately... But of course, you know, when those kind of scenarios happen, several questions as to uh, what transpired, how, what happened, how do we ensure these things don't happen again, and it's always the dominant narrative. But at the moment, um, it was, I think, over 23, about 24, or something at 9 p.m. yesterday. It's now risen to 24 people who have been rescued and rushed to the hospital. And then questions as to, the FCDA, uh, some of the persons that I say, look, they need to ask them further questions, allocating green areas to commercial ventures and several other checks and balances, they drop the ball in several regards. So it is always a thing. And I remember, guys, when we talk about these kind of scenarios in Lagos, and then you hear the narratives of the professionals, how they tell you that, look, they do what they can, but some of these persons who are influential, just seem to muzzle their way, disregard them the law, and live in their hands tied. And so it makes it a lot more difficult for lots of them. And then several others will tell you, look, exorbitant prices, the inflationary rate, make it a lot difficult for them to hire the services of professionals to ensure that they do their bit. But you know, um, if we don't do the right things, even as individuals, it will just boil down to us being penny-wise, pound-foolish, because you can't spend so much money only for it to go down the drain. And in some cases, I, I'm trying to remember, what even happened to that case in Lagos? I think they were trying to take over the property. So those kind of consequences, we should think about all of those things as we progress. But for this one, oh boy, it's kind of shocking that uh, it's happening in the FCT, because I thought that there were measures in place to ensure that these things don't even happen, haven't seen the effects and the unfortunate scenarios that happen across the country, but who knows? But uh, we'll be looking to the authorities here to speak, for, speak further and tell the people what really is going on, what measures are put in place to ensure this doesn't happen again. Well, you know when you said you thought that because this is the FCT, I want to say sorry, you thought wrong. <laughs> oh, the FCT dear. is... A microcosm. I mean, it's supposed to be an ideal place. The, the, you know, the place that models the aspirations of Nigeria as That's a country. Right. Uh, this FCT, as we all know, is relatively new. It was a capital that was chosen. It was purpose-built. Um, Abuja to represent, I mean, taking right to the heart, uh, Lisbon is per perceived to be the center of the country, so that we all have that sense of unity, we all have that sense of purpose. We all are, you know, together in, in you know, in, in so many things. And it's supposed to uh, signify our aspirations, our collective desire to show the model of the kind of country that we, that we want. But sadly, you know, we, we since found that infrastructure, the fact that you have big, wide, fancy roads, I do not exactly mean that the people will act any different. If they're not going to, if they're not acting any different in Lagos or Anambra or Kaduna or, you know, wherever it is, and then everybody comes and, and you're going to take people from these places to come and populate this city, 
you're not going to act any differently here. Unless, of course, perhaps the leadership is different. And so far, so good. The leadership exactly hasn't been sterling. So this is what you get. The people, I mean, there, there will be blames enough to, to, to go around because what we understand or what we hear in preliminary reports are showing or are saying that this, this building was okay until a developer decided to add an extra floor. And we thought that by now we'll be, we'll be wiser. We thought that by now we would have learned lessons from all of the disasters that we've seen, especially with developers or owners trying to cut corners, you know, going beyond what was approved for you, not getting experts, especially when you're building multiple floors, not getting the real experts to come and, you know, keep an eye on what is going on. When we populate our industry with quacks, this is precisely what we'll keep getting. We'll continue to endanger lives. We'll continue to, you know, kill people unnecessarily because the loss of lives that have been experienced right now in this building collapse were totally avoidable, totally avoidable. The injuries that people have sustained as a result of uh, this building collapse were totally avoidable. And I think once we begin to see consequences, until people begin to get punished for this sort of avoidable, the other day was a, a container falling on, 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 a, on, on a bus and killing nine people, including children. Uh, we understand the Lagos State government has said that, you know, there needs to be a prosecution and they're going to prosecute in that instance. Um, now we're seeing a building collapse. Until we begin to prosecute, like we're currently, the Lagos State government is currently prosecuting inspector, is it Vrambi or Vrandi? Vandi. 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 Yeah. That's some Indian sounding name. Some inspector Vandi, you know, and holding him to account uh, for the killing of Bolanli Rahim. You know, this sort of things will continue to go on until we begin to see, you know, people going to jail as a result. Because not only have you d destroyed things, you've killed people. So until people are, begin, are, are, are held to account and, and you know, who, who understand the consequences of things going wrong, especially at a construction site, I'm afraid that these are the kinds of things that we'll continue to see. Very sad, and it wouldn't matter whether it is in the FCT or it's in Lagos, or it's in uh, Kano. Until people are held accountable, this is what we'll continue to see. Bukola and Ayo. Well, Maupa is really sad. And uh, first of all, we commiserate with uh, families of those who have loved, lost loved ones in that uh, building collapse. And, uh, you know, just to pick up from, you know, where you started from about Abuja being a model of the aspirations of you know Nigerians collectively we can say the same of Lagos the commercial capital in fact the nation's former capital being a symbolism of some sorts of the aspirations of Nigerians collectively you know it's a metropolitan uh, area of some sorts you know where cosmopolitan I beg your pardon where people aspire you know to be to live uh, you know the middle class, the high class, the elite, you know, but look at the uh, statistics of building collapse in Lagos. Uh, and uh, you would think that it would uh, be restricted to areas, particularly the island, where those buildings are built in such close proximity, you know, that developers circumvent the process, they do not abide by the rules and regulations. But then again, you find it in other parts of Lagos as well. You find it in Ikoi, you find it in Leki. And, uh, you know, true to the facts, as you've, you know, rightly pointed out to us about the one in Abuja that occurred yesterday, that the developer de decided to add an additional uh, building, to, uh, you know, uh, apart from what had been approved, it's the same narrative for uh, collapsed buildings, uh, in, uh, uh, especially in these times. And, you know, you, you wonder who's approving, what's happening to the... Uh, officials at the Federal Capital Territory Authority. The same goes for Lagos. Who are those officials approving such? And, you know, just to call out the authorities, they're zealous to collect ground rents. Uh, the last I checked, uh, the FCTA uh, said that, uh, you know, Abuja residents, uh, property owners are only, uh, owing uh, ground rent to the tune of 29 billion naira. If they are zealous to collect taxes and call out tenant, uh, uh, 
owners, property owners, to pay their taxes, why shouldn't the same officials be zealous, you know, to ensure quality control, to ensure that the right amount of cement is what is being, uh, you know, put together to ensure that that structure goes up, to ensure that um, it is what's approved that is built from ground up. But we do not see all of that, and it is sad. Uh, just to add to the point that until you know, uh, there is a culture of deterrence across board, not just where property development is concerned, but for all forms of crimes and abuse of processes in this country, we'll continue to sit down and speak about the same issues. Three people dead at the beginning of the year is really sad. You know, um, while everyone was speaking, I just remembered how a clergyman and a leadership consultant, uh, Dr. Samadiemi, responded to the issue Malpe raised about the killing, well, the death, unfortunate death of those nine people on the Ujulegba Bridge in Lagos. He said, look, until we begin to pay attention to the value of human lives, we won't get around this. And I think it goes across board in any and everything that we do as a nation, as individuals, first of all, before we even become uh, a Nigerian, before any other sentiment comes to play. There are regulators. First, one of the issues that came to my mind is we cannot afford to take our eyes off the ball at any given point in time. There are a lot of distractions. People talk about different kinds of cues they have to get on every day. Some of these people who are regulators also have to jump on these queues. Fuel queue, uh, Naira queue, PVC queue, and all those things. These information are, are washed all over the country today. But we cannot afford to take our eyes off the ball. Who is monitoring the builders? Who is monitoring those who are monitoring the builders? At what point did we take our eyes off the ball? Papa, you're correct. And Bukola, you're right. Unless prosecution takes place unless there is deterrence, uh, these things are, are, are going to continue. But then who is monitoring the process to ensure that there is a daily reporting of building projects that are ongoing on a daily basis? We have to also pay attention to the people whose jobs it is to ensure that the right things are done, the right materials are used and all of that. And then who gives the approvals? Malpa, you also mentioned the fact that we are already taking over some places that houses shouldn't be built. It's all a, a wash of what some people have called a, an erosion of our ethical values, which the vice president recently pointed to. At what point are we going to get to that point where we say, you know what, whatever it is that I will do, I will first of all think about the next person, person beside me, my neighbor, my friend, my, my co-worker, even my enemy, their lives deserve some value. Can we start from there? Whoever is in whatever level of government, even if you're just a salary earner, value someone else's life because what goes around always comes around. Chamberlain. And I hope they do remember all of that uh, as a matter of fact because uh, there's some of the key challenges that we are going through at the moment. But um, Let's jump right ahead and take you through some of the dailies here this morning. We'll start with the Daily Trust, Naira Crisis, APC Governors Reject February 10 Deadline. I know, you could ask yourself, what is going on with this one? Tell immediately, people are paying to get their money. First of the rider, demand one year extension to meet Bari today. Protests in Lagos. Military operations suffer as troops in bushes cash strapped. Only masses are suffering. Politicians having their way. So, there you go. Well, this is what's developing about this one. So, is this the kind of impression uh, that um, the regulatory bodies wanted to achieve? There you go. So, I remember the time we spoke separately as to whether or not the SWOT analysis had been done, uh, how this was going to be affected, because I only cite what the authorities have said several times as to when a lot of those intervention programs, I know I've heard more than once, uh, the challenge that the CBN said they have with DMBs uh, going on and playing their part, it seems to be a thing. 
And now, even with this currency we design, you see the Naira crisis, APC governments rejecting the February 10 deadline. What, it, what could be the implications of this? Well, there you go. Um, part of what we'll focus on, by the way. We're not afraid of anybody. El Rufai dares Villa Cabals. Whoever you think they are. So, and then at the bottom street, two killed, 40 trapped as building collapses in Abuja. Developer violated building plan, described to the FHA, who also, by the way, uh, they say that they're testing the integrity of the buildings under construction in those areas. And according to them, anyone found culpable, they say they will, uh, the, the law, they will the big stick. So I'm hoping that uh, every one of them there will comply because I tell you, I tell you, the rent, the rents, oh boy, they are over the roof. So if the rent is over the roof, then they must comply. I, I support the FHA on this matter. <laughs> That's um, the trust. Yeah. <laughs> well, take a look. So says a new tenant in Abuja. <laughs> <laughs> so says a new tenant in Abuja. I'm on the side of the law. <laughs> Who isn't? Please stand up. Let's see you. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> well, Vanguard is the paper I'm looking at for you this morning. And this is what it has. Naira notes. I mean, the headline is certainly not funny. Naira notes scarcity hurting Nigerians. That is a credit attributed to Fashola and Ahmed. Uh, policy must be reviewed. Uh, that's according to Fashola. Buhari unhappy over Naira redesign hardship. Uh, that's Ahmed. That's a minister of finance. Um, <laughs> Well, if he's not happy, then he had better do something about it. Because it will interest you to know that even people within the CBN are hurting. Uh, yes, there are people who buy every day. So if you think that because people work at the CBN, they will just have access to it. That's not how it works. It's, it does seem like the, the current payment systems we have are, are overwhelmed by the level of transactions that they're currently staying. So for many hours yesterday, some systems were down, not working. Uh, look at this. Says initial hardship necessary for economy. So maybe that's also a plea to bear with the situation. Presidential candidates are bank owners not affected. That's, you know, from uh, Kwan Kwan So, uh, presidential candidate of the NNPP. He said that on Sunrise Daily yesterday. So that's something that governments might want to take a look at. If part of the unintended consequences of this is to curb vote buying, as we've been told, or as we have, has been said, um, and politicians are the ones getting first access to this money, <laughs> you have to ask. So it's going to enhance it, vote buying. Exactly. It's going to enhance it. Because on that day, who knows, maybe we'll just see deluge of new Naira notes and we're wondering, oh, where did this rain come from? So are people going to look the other way? Uh, when they have not seen it in a very long time. You know, scarcity does cause distortion. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that this will be handled quickly. Um, viral video shows terrorists brandishing wads of new notes. It's already in the wrong hands. CBN directs banks to pay redesigned Naira note over the counter. Limits payment to 20,000 Naira per day to join police other agencies in prosecuting note sellers. So that story is on page 5 of the paper. NNPCL Daewoo sealed $740 million deal for Cardona's refinery repairs. So it looks like they're about to undertake another repair again. We're not behind sit at home order to disrupt elections, according to IPOB. Once Pan Piek, I don't know what, what the acronym means, to desist from linking it with such order. So you might want to flip to page 11 to see who Pan Piek is. Campaign, we care afraid of our massive mobilization, says PDP PCC. So the internal crisis within the PDP is still ongoing. It's Friday, so I'm going to do Mr. and Mrs. I know how you're saying, yay. <laughs> look, at, <laughs> look at what Mrs. is saying right now. Um, Mrs. says, you need to see how people respected me at the market today. I felt on top of the world. Someone even addressed me as first lady. 
because I paid for all the things I bought with new Naira notes. The landlord's wife was there, staring at me with her mouth wide open. <laughs> I feel sorry for, land oh, oh, for the tenant. <laughs> landlord's wife was looking at you like that. <laughs> you know what to expect next. Guess what Mr. says? says, oh Lord, see what this government caused. <laughs> because he knows what's coming next. <laughs> Increment of rent. It might just fall you have new narrow nose. Since you have new narrow nose. And spread it. But really, this situation which Mrs. is mm -hmm. talking about, you know, when you go to the market with cash these days, you're really, cash with truly is king. So you're really the mm. queen. If, if you go to the market and you have new narrow nose. Let's leave it there, Obanga newspapers. Oh dear. And flip to leadership newspaper and it does a check, a countdown on uh, the election. 22 days to go. First of all, 2023 presidency. 22 days to go. PDP accuses Wike of working for Tinubu. That's interesting. So, you know, uh, the crisis uh, in that party uh, is yet to abate. Uh, it looks like uh, there's no, uh, you know, well, sign of uh, feuding factions coming together but you know as they say 24 hours you know can make a difference where politics is concerned especially the Nigerian brand of politics and I recall Malpec you know calling out uh, people yesterday to supply us with, with information just in case you know who Governor Wiki has endorsed and told his people in Rivers to vote for. Please let us know. We are, we really like to know this morning. Or are you, are you any, do you have a different opinion? I plead the fifth. <laughs> You've been pleading the fifth since the beginning of the program. Yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to having you change your mind. But let's take a look at the riders to see if we can get more insight. We didn't stop your rally. Rivers Governor replies. State party executives back Wiki against Atiku. 22 APC governors behind Ashiwaju that subscribe to L5. There's more politics. Let's go uh, beneath the nameplate this morning. Step down, apologize to Southern governors. Uh, that's one of the Niger Delta leaders there, uh, Chief Edwin Clark. Clark tells Okoa. Uh, if you read some other. Uh, captions on other newspapers is asking for accountability of, on uh, de derivation funds uh, of uh, Delta State. I think 250 billion naira. So there's so many angles to uh, events uh, happening within the opposition, the main opposition party. We hope to have a conversation on that in the coming days. I'll take a look at this one next, right beside that, that one. Jigawa residents excited over 17 billion Naira Hadejia irrigation scheme. You know, one of the things missing amid this campaign, development, how to move the people from where they are to where they want to be. We've heard more of uh, politics, more of who is doing who, what against who, rather than you know what the people want. Uh, in 2023 and beyond. But just before we exit um, the leadership newspaper, let's go to the bottom strip to see a few more stories. Uh, Southern Middle Belt leaders vow to deliver OB. We saw that report yesterday where uh, the LP candidate get, got yet another endorsement. And uh, lastly, violence in Southeast must be crushed. That's the scribe to the inspector general of police and you see the picture from the tragic building collapse in abuja yesterday also uh, captioned captured on the front page of leadership on friday let's leave it there for leadership newspaper nigerian news direct is next on uh, the lineup this morning and it's talking about naira scarcity but well, guess what the caption says FG begs Nigerians as CBN directs banks to pay customers new notes. I know this is not in the paper, but I can hear the Nigerians also saying, Nigerians beg FG. I don't know if that's something that will say, but hey, look at the writers. Nigeria, Naira redesign will curb corruption, grow Nigeria's economy. And the second one there says it's a price to pay for a nation's economy to recover. That's ascribed to the finance minister's stories on page 13. 
of the paper that's it right there on your screen and um, uh, so many other news information for you at the bottom of the page you have this one fuel scarcity not planned to sabotage election that's ascribed to the NNPC and it's most certainly something that governments uh, even the NNPC has to convince Nigerians about because there are several people wondering this hasn't happened in quite a few years why now what's the intention it's a lot of displeasure I so much more than that to get the government to do right by them mm. it's really a, a tough situation uh, the, across the country right yeah, now I remember the conversation we had with uh, dr muda yusuf yesterday Is it yesterday yes yes was also saying look this thing could spiral into some social unrest and let us all be aware that as chamberlain has often reminded us we only know the beginning of such things we really don't know how far it's going to go how far it'll end that's a nigerian news direct newspaper this morning Take a look at the Guardian newspaper. It's a similar narrative from them about this uh, implications of the Naira scarcity. Well, the Guardian CSOs picket offices as banks beam searchlights on branch managers. So, oh boy, it is a big one all over the place this morning. There are lots of riders here. I'll let you go through it yourself because we're going to focus on that as well. Uh, this morning, so uh, just holding a bit. But you also get to see at the bottom strip, INEC insists elections will not be postponed. So do what you will, plan what you may, elections will not be postponed. That is the Guardian this morning. Um, do we have any further yep. papers? I'm uh -huh. thinking this Nigeria. That's right. Uh, this Nigeria says you should have kept your mouth shut. <laughs> Yeah, that's the lead headline. Somebody is speaking to somebody. This Nigeria, just in case you're wondering which paper that is. You should have kept your mouth shut. El Rafai tackles Lai Mohammed over defense of Asorok Mafia against Tinobu's candidature. So you find details on page two of the paper. This is still going on. Uh, <laughs> you certainly want to read inside that paper. Lawmakers fume as contractors delay NAS complex renovation. Okay, polls court orders INEC to accept Labour Party's candidates in 24 states. So some legal martyrs sorted there. Two dead, 50 trapped, seven rescued in Abuja building collapse. We've done that for you. And Clark to Okoa, God won't answer your prayers to be VP. A very strong statement there. Uh, from the from one of the leaders of in the Niger Delta Pandev, account for 250 billion naira derivation funds you collected. A story somewhere inside the paper, and then look just on top of the nameplate there. Custom sees fake eight six fake six million dollars. Arrest four at Seme border. That's what we have on the front page of this Nigeria. Yeah, so that ends a look at some of the dailies here this morning. We're back in just a moment and we will be talking about the implications of this scarcity of the currency in just a moment. Stay with us. The Central Bank of Nigeria is asking Kwara State residents to make use of the super agent across different communities in order to exchange their old Naira notes. The CBN says the cash swap by super agents, otherwise known as POS operators, 
is an initiative that will ensure people living in rural areas to change their monies before the expiration of the deadline, which has now been shifted beyond February 17th. <laughs> Areas monitored in the metropolis of Bushiri, Bani, and Ogidi. One of the POS operators is asking the CBN for more cash notes so that he can swap for residents in his area. It was going intensively because as I was trying to manage the own oh, cash that they give to me, I managed it well and I have a appropriate record for everything that I have done. Yeah. Director of Consumer Protection, CBN, Rashida Mungunu wants residents to take advantage of the services of agents to change their old Naira notes. We should move into the rural areas to ensure that uh, the less privileged and the vulnerable who are mostly affected by this uh, policy are not, um, uh, you know, we should lessen their pains to ensure that the place everywhere is wet with the new uh, Naira and of course other denominations of our currency. The team later paid a courtesy call on Governor Abdurrahman Abdurrazak, where he expressed his willingness to support the scheme to succeed. It's quite proactive for you to come in, um, to sit there and send a team to various states to see that compliance is being followed through, down to the grassroots level. Um, we appreciate that and we continue to engage um, the citizens, um, traditional institutions, um, students, um, all various segments of society, the farmers, NGOs, um, to pass the message through. The CBN promises residents that new narrow notes will be dispensed across all automated teller machines as well as POS operators across the state in order to make the process a seamless exercise. Welcome back. That is what we are starting with this morning on Sunrise today. And you can see Mr. Shahi Aditayo joins us, the former state security operative. He joins us from Maryland. Good morning and thank you for joining us on the program today. Well, I, I, at the moment, I uh, hope you can hear me. Yeah, good morning, Chamberlain. Okay, good morning. So uh, back home here, this currency scarcity is hitting everyone hard. I'm not sure you can feel the pinch from where you are. But you have also been cautious a little bit about this previously. So, uh, and we also know that this definitely can have security implications. So what, what, when you see all of these narratives as they build up across the country, and I know security agencies always look to this kind of issues to ensure that things don't get out of hand. So what are your thoughts at the first instance on what the trajectory and how this seems to be playing out now? Okay, yeah, good morning, uh, Chamberlain. Uh, actually, um, I've seen this. Uh, I saw this coming, and uh, I remember having conversations with my colleagues that uh, we're going to find ourselves in situations where um, if care is not taken, and I want to repeat, if care is not taken, the election might not hold. And it's very, very important that we actually pay attention to what is going on in the communities as we speak. People are angry. People don't have money to actually go to work. It's not that they don't have money in their account, they don't have the raw cash. But this is a cash, every cash dependent economy. And when you want to make such transition in a population of almost about 200 million people, it means that you are talking about money spreading into the hands of at least 100 million, you know, adults and young adults that will need cash. So, and you can't do that in 45 days. Because that is a situation that we found ourselves where we have to move money around within 45 days in a cash, heavily cash dependent economy. I was saying how this is already impacting the communities. My fear is this the pocket of crisis that we're seeing, uh, that it doesn't degenerate in a couple of days uh, if we don't address these issues. And let, let me give you an example. Uh, you've been driving in the city of Lagos. Have you taken notice of the reduction in the numbers of orcas in traffic in Lagos? Those who sell inside traffic, they've really gone down. 
Because people, not that they don't have the commodity to sell, they don't have people with cash to buy from them. And you can't do POS transaction inside traffic. Now, the, the downside of this to this is that, where are those guys? What will those guys be doing in the next one week? They don't have a job to do. They don't have means of earning income. What will they do? The, uh, the suppliers, the manufacturers of the West, especially, let me give an example. Those who are selling planting chips in the traffic, they are being produced. By, by small, small factories around the communities. There are people working there. If they don't sell the ones they have, it means they're not going to produce, which means there is no more work for those guys that are working in those small you know, industries that are producing things like chips and the rest. Then the materials that those things, those people bought, like the plantain, they used to produce those plantain chips are going to be dead. They have to go to get rotten because there's no longer um, sales for what they're going to produce. So this is already producing chunks of people that are becoming unemployed. And that is just one example. Now, if you look around the whole society, that is exactly what is happening right now. Production rate is actually going down. People are not being able to exchange, you know, have source of income. Those who want to go to work that, that uh, depends on daily income who not go to work because they don't have the cash to pay conductor, school will not collect the whole cash from them. And they are stuck at home. There are parents who could not send their children to school right now because there is no money for them to buy food when they get to school. So it's a major issue that we're seeing that may spiral uh, into something that we do not. We can see the way people are expressing their anger. And um, you know, from my own understanding, as, and as someone who has been in intelligence for so many years, you know, part of what we do in intelligence is to get the pulse of the people. You, 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 you try to feel the pulse of the people. You talk to the people in the community. Try to, you know, get public opinion. You sample your opinion. You'll be able to weigh and predict what will likely happen. I saw this about three, four weeks ago, and I said, this is going to happen. And we're seeing it happening now. So the impact of this on security is going to be monumental. Now, why do we have this policy? The reason you know proposed for this policy has already been defeated. Number one, about uh, is copying terrorism. I see uh, no way this is going to cop terrorism. We've seen videos now and even pictures of bandits, you know, waving words of you know, new nose and claiming they have them in millions already, which means that they have their ways of sourcing for this money. And it is true because in areas where they operate, they control everything around those areas. If they want money in the bank, they know they threaten the bank, they, the bankers will provide the money. If it's to control um, election, it is already defeated. Because number one, those who need money for election, they find a way of getting this money ready, readily. Secondly, the CDN Act made it mandatory, and it is there. And CDN government could not dispute the fact that you cannot even though you make the money not to become a legal tender after a specific date, you cannot stop the money from being allowed into the banks. Which means that if, you're, if your concern is that you don't want people to be given money on election days, but with the constitution right now, the law right now, and the CDN governor's confession, politicians can still spend the old notes on election day. Maybe instead of giving 10,000, they will give people 50,000 this time around, because people can now take this money after election, take it to the bank, and deposit the money, and the bank cannot stop them, because that is what the constitution says. So it is already defeated, as it is now. And then, if that is the case, then why are we suffering? Why are we allowing situation? I fear that in the next couple of days, we might begin to see situations where traffic robberies will go on high you know high rates in in cities because those people that could not work right now those oceans those uh orcas that could not work may end up looking for ways of feeding themselves and uh, we may see upsurge in crime rates in nigeria it's a very grim picture that you've painted um Sadetayo, and i yeah. um, it's a good thing you say that security agencies 
usually make this sort of projections. Um, how aware are you of whether or not when the CBN was going to implement this, uh, is, it is it usual or normal for security agencies to be carried along in terms of looking at, you know, what the implication could be on the larger society? So um, security agencies are not policymakers, but they advise policymakers. So when policymakers uh, make their uh, policies, it is a responsibility of security, especially intelligence agencies, to help them to do what they call public perception. They will take the policy and try to get the, the, the feelings in the community, how people are receiving, and they advise the government to say, the policy you just made, this is how people are taking it. You need to do one, two, three, or four things to ensure that your policy uh, succeeds. And at times, it might be try to advise them to tweak the policy or to even re, you know, change the policy entirely, either to drop it or oh, people accept your policy. And I can assure you that this time, on these particular situations, they had given lots of intelligence to government to say, this will create a problem. I have never seen it in anywhere in the world, including cashless society, where transition from old currency to new currencies are done in 45 days. But this is where we're having this push because the initial deadline was 45 days between December 15, when the new currency was introduced, and January 31st. That put pressure in the society, expecting about 100 million people and what we're seeing right now also shows that the production capacity and the quantity of the new Nera note is not enough. And that's the reason why we're having this. You don't transit a heavily dependent, cash dependent economy into a cashless economy overnight, 45 days. You see, we have no other country. This is the only country we have. And we must be very, very careful what we do and how we push ourselves you know, to, to, to the brink. And that is what we're having right now. The pressure is so much. Um, even those outside the country, they are complaining. I don't have any new Naira notes. I don't have any, um, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be back into the country. I don't even know how I'm gonna survive because even those that are left at home, they don't even have the new Naira notes. And many of them cannot even afford to go and kill endlessly at the bank. Let me give you, uh, an instance, I was speaking to a friend within the diplomatic community, and he said that um, the, a bank brought the new Nara note into their ATM machine, and uh, you know, within 10 minutes, after 25 people collected 20, 20,000, because they tried to monitor it, and the whole money finished. So they, when they multiplied, they discovered that the bank only put 500,000 Nara into the machine. This is one of the major diplomatic, you know, uh, establishments, embassies in Nigeria. And you know what is happening? He said, the diplomats were meeting those who collected 20,000 and to say, please, give me 1,000 Naira. Let me transfer 1,000 Naira to you. So they will go, this one will go and meet one person and collect 1,000, another. So you can imagine that this is not about the rural people being affected. The cities are affected. The diplomatic community are affected, even though initially they were singing that, oh, maybe it was going to help us to have, finally have a corruption-free election. It's no longer about the election, it's about survival. They themselves are not seeing it in that way anymore. They are feeling the hardship, they are sad, they are unhappy. Well, and that is the situation right now. You know, having, uh, I mean, you painted several scenarios. So if they all have intelligence, they know what the consequences will be or can be, how it may spiral out of control if it continues in this trajectory, because how do you tell people who go to the banks that they can't access their own money? And you're not talking about millions of Naira here. If on just a few thousands of Naira, they, they can't get access to that. So it will be frustrating for anybody. And several people out there who are already frustrated with the situation in the country. So add this to it, so you can imagine how that will play out. But there are also several conspiracy theories out there uh, where people think, look, even though today we hear INEC say, no matter what happens, the elections should not be postponed. What kind of implications do you think? Because there are those who think some of these measures might just have been orchestrated to ensure frustrations on the part of Nigerians, 
so that they take it out on election day or on the party or something to thwart or tilt something in one way or the other. Are these possibilities just what? A wild goose chase or just figment of people's imagination? Do you see any iota of, excuse me, any iota of possible reality in all of these narratives? Um, like my focus is on the security implication. And I can also pick some words from what I've seen politicians say. Um, the, from the dailies to me, uh, we saw the comment from the, uh, the presidential candidate of NNPP saying that the politicians already have this money, which means that whatever we want to achieve in terms of um, the sanctity of our elections has already been defeated already. So which means that even if they need money to share, they may not have as much as they will have intended to, but it definitely is not going to stop. So that has already been defeated. Now back to the election proper. I make fixed dates, now fixed dates, but I make cannot determine whether election we hold or not. It is the society that will determine whether it is ready to go into ballot or not. And the net, I mean, coming days will determine whether Nigerians will actually be in the mood to go into elections or not, when people can bid. No, we are looking at the reality of civil society. And uh, my fear is this. The circumstances around NSAS are entirely different from what we're having right now. And uh, this time around, um, both the North and the South are affected. Both the rich and the poor are affected. Both the educated and illiterate are affected. It's not just about young people that are afraid of uh, police harassing them. It's about people not being able to feed their family, not be able to buy things, not can go to work. No, that is the issue that we are seeing right now. And it is important that we look at this issue carefully and make, first of all, secure the society. That is where we can go into election. It's not about Boko Haram, you know, fighting in some parts of the country. It's not about bandit holding. It's about the entire populace not being able to live their life. So it's not. Well, Mr. Dita, I think we'll like to believe that we believe that the security agencies themselves will know if protests across the country about this are sponsored or is it organic. So uh, who knows what their conclusion or their findings will be about this one. But let's bring in our colleagues in Lagos. They've got questions for you as well. Thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, Mr. Dita, just to be clear, um, perhaps you may want to make this as, as explicit and as advisory as possible. We're already seeing, um, of course, I'm sure you have seen videos of people fighting inside banks. Some people believe behaving in ways they wouldn't normally have behaved. Queues on the roads in front of, the, of banks, of ATMs, struggles, quarrels are already happening. And in pockets of places all over the place, all over Nigeria, scarcity of fuel persists. We have had uh, stories where some pump stations say, if you do not have brand new notes, you, we will not sell for you. Our uh, POS is not working and stuff like that. This is a build-up and it is scary. You say that it is completely different from uh, the uh, NSAR situation that brought what it brought. But what are the implications of this? If a lockdown could generate what it generated, uh, we, in 2020, such that there was such a massive hue and cry all over the place. Isn't this a little riskier? That, as you said, is affecting everybody, everybody across board. What are the implications of this, especially on our social security, as we build up to an election? Yeah, so I think we're, we're saying the same thing. You know, um, what I was saying is the scenario for NSAS was different, not even as much as what we see today. During NSAS, people had opportunity to stop. People still have opportunity to buy. Some people didn't have opportunity to go to work, to earn more, but it didn't affect all. This time around, both the rich and the poor are affected. And that is the most scary part of what we have right now. And 
if we allow this to snowball into crisis, we may not have the strength to curtail it. You know, for the first time in the life of this nation, we're having parallel market for Naira now, not just about dollar or foreign currency. Naira is now being sold at different rates. It's just for you to find out who is selling it cheaper and who is selling it higher in the same country. So scarcity brings about tension, brings about crisis, and that is what we have in our hands. Uh, talking about um, people taking advantage, advantage that will happen in any society you always have you always have 50 colonies whether it's in the us or it is in egypt or anywhere there will be people who will definitely want to take advantage you know it will definitely help expect i mean the projected crisis to even happen faster than expected because they have their own object and they may not necessarily be politicians but they just have interest in using the opportunity to create crisis you know, push for their own agenda and try to see how they can install themselves into reckoning when crisis is on. We mustn't give people, those people, opportunity to take advantage of this. The earlier government addressed it. And the solution to this is just very simple. Remove the deadline. Speaking, of, speaking of which, Mr. Detail. Sorry, good morning, Mr. Detayos. Speaking of which, you were talking about um, fifth columnists and agendas. Um, I wonder if you're following the conversation from about a week before now. You know, one of the candidates was complaining, saying that, uh, you know, the fuel scarcity, the narrow redesign was targeted at him. Uh, the other candidate was a bit more temperate and uh, initially called for the extension but as now said, no, do not extend beyond the February 10 deadline. Um, do you see any um, undertones, you know, uh, amid the Naira redesign policy? Because not one, there's a groundswell of opinion that this is coming at a wrong time. You see, politicians will uh, behave like politicians to play their politics. Uh, politicians have reasons why they say the things that they say. Uh, I'm here to talk about the reality on ground, and this is affecting the entire society. It's not about politicians right now. It's about everybody. Politicians are feeling it. Everybody, they are feeling it. The politicians, too, cannot even work freely in the community as we speak right now. They also find it difficult to campaign to the people be it uh, ruling whether you are a ruling party, you are an opposition party or whatever, you are finding it difficult. Because even if you are contesting ordinarily, the people in your community will bring all their problems to you. Whether you are in power or you are a fresh candidate, they want you to help solve their school, children's school fees issues, medical issues, you know, take advantage of you. And that's why politicians spend so much. Now right. imagine a situation where the people cannot even eat. So the politicians are having monumental issues on them right now because all those people are now rushing to the most position for survival. So it's right. nobody's actually feeling it right. It's uh it's actually a scenario that uh really needs to be addressed uh as soon as possible. But we do thank you for your time. Uh, very early hours where you are. Thank you very much indeed, Shay Adita, your former state security thank operative. You. Welcome back. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Brahma Sudi joins us now. He's the former chairman of the APC in uh, Taraba State. Good Present. morning. Present. Present chairman, pardon yes. me. Current chairman of APC. So wait, you're presiding over all of this that's going back and forth. I thought you have it under control by now. Why is that the case? Well, it is under control. The, the party is moving. We're moving with our campaigns. How are you moving? With, with the uh, Supreme Court decision? With the Supreme Court decision, it doesn't stop anything because... It is the right of an individual to go to court, and they have exhausted it. And the Supreme Court has now ordered that there should be a fresh election. But that's a, not what a you fresh want. primary election, yes. 
But this defeat, this is clearly not what your party wants, not what the, uh, Senator Bacha would like. So you're not in control to that extent. As far as litigations are concerned, we are not in control, obviously. It is the right of an individual to go to court. It is his right to purchase forms and then contest. Doesn't it justify? The Constitution equally gives him the right to go to court. Yeah, we and we have no control over that. We know that. But doesn't it then justify what they've always said from the get-go, that there was no election in Tarabat? Well, the court has said it, and we have accepted it. We cannot say otherwise. It means that all of those who were saying from the get-go that this was always the case, that they, they're, is they're the, right. That is the position of the Supreme Court, and we are bound by it. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, as APC chairman, are you neutral in all of this? Obviously, I am. I am neutral. You are. Yeah. So you're looking forward to conducting fresh polls? Obviously, I am looking forward to conducting a fresh election if the national secretariat of our party gives us a new date. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be a level playing ground. And obviously, I am not the person to conduct the fresh primary election. It is the national secretariat that appoints uh, persons to go and conduct such fresh primary elections. All I am to do is to give them an enabling environment for them to operate smoothly and then come out with a, a, a result. Mm. So I'm just looking at the fact that, I mean, you are APC chairman in Taraba State. You had two major, um, you know, two major stalwarts within your party, um, you know, in disagreement. As a matter of fact, they're looking at the, 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 uh, the I'm looking for the word now, the defection of Senator Bwacha from the PDP <coughs> to the APC as somewhat, as something of a betrayal <coughs> to those who have been loyal uh, to the APC. How are you as APC chairman managing the sentiments that people felt or perceived with the defection of Senator Bwacha and him clinching a ticket initially? I'm happy you said the sentiment. Mm -hmm. They are not the law. The constitution of the party recognizes uh, any individual that joins the party, even if it is today, as an equal partner. And they are at equal power with those that uh, you know, started the party. And therefore, let us not be sentimental. You can remain in the party for 10 years. Somebody can come today, you are equal. Only there can be some deprivations, like say, you will not be allowed to contest unless and until you are in the party for the past six months, three months. There is a, a constitutional provision to that effect. Yeah, there's a reason why parties set those kinds of uh, constitutional provisions within their own laws. There is a reason why parties do it. It's so that they can manage the sentiments of people who have been loyal to the party. And I know that in politics, loyalty is something that is extremely important. So when you say people shouldn't look at sentiment, are you really being realistic when you as a politician, oftentimes what you do is appeal to emotions? Well, I'm doing justice to the issue. I am supposed to be neutral. And I will remain neutral. Any person that joins the party and the constitution allows him to contest and the people allow him to emerge, then you have no reason to, to deny him that. But since we have now been given the opportunity for a fresh election, if the majority of uh, you know, APC uh, stalwarts and uh, members feel that, look, this is a new person, we should jettison him. So be it. But if they decide to vote him, you have no right to deny him. Okay. So as far as you... But um, what I'm trying to say is, for those people who feel that somehow the party could be favoring, uh, you know, favoring or looking at certain candidates, uh, how do you manage their own emotions? Uh, do you reach out to them? Do you try to pacify them? What precisely do you do? As leader, are you just going to sit back and say, well, that's the law. So, you know, uh, we're only following the law. The law recognizes new members. They have equal rights. Is that what you do? Obviously, that is what I do. I don't, uh, you know, uh, appeal to the sentiments and emotions of uh, uh, individuals other than to plead with them to understand each other. 
and then give every person a level playing ground. I have nothing to lose. Okay. Oh, so right now, some people are also afraid that with this, um, with this <clears throat> ruling of the, uh, of, of the Supreme Court, they're wondering if the, you will be able to conduct fresh primaries going by the fact that the window f on, within which you're supposed to conduct primaries, as stipulated by INEC, is already closed. Well, the window as stipulated or rather uh, as contemplated by the Electoral Act is subject to the Constitution. It says 180 days before election that you should forward your names, uh, the names of uh, your candidates that emerge from your primary election. Yet, under Section 285, uh, subsection 9 of the 1999 Constitution, it empowers an individual that is not uh, happy with the outcome of an election to approach the Federal High Court for relief. If the Constitution says, well, uh, you, you, if you are not happy, you should approach the court, then the issue of 180 days does not even arise because it is a constitutional uh, provision. It overrides and supersedes the provision of the Electoral Act. And once you go to court, in the court of first instance, you have 180 days. In uh, the court of appeal, you have 60 days. In the Supreme Court, you have another 60 days. That is what the Constitution says. If the Supreme Court finally determines uh, the action, even if the election is going to take place tomorrow, that is the law of the land. Right. It has to be obeyed. Have you, ever since this judgment, you or your, uh, I mean, you or Senator Bacha reached out to the other persons in the team who are not happy with the way the elections went in the first place? Well, the, the, the judgment was uh, delivered uh, two days ago, and we have not seen the tenor or the content of the judgment. So it is after we read the judgment, dissect and understand it, then we approach, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the parties, individuals, aggrieved parties, for their understanding. Let them be united. Boacha and the other persons should sit down and talk to each other. If they are unable to agree, we have no option than to allow them to go for the uh, fresh primaries. So at the moment, you haven't reached out to anyone I until, have you not, reach the, until you reach the I have the not until I read the judgment. Then I will be able to understand the tenor and content. Then we will approach them. But you know that, the, I mean, quite a number of other people think the scenario that played out in Zafra the last time, where the APC ended up not having a candidate, could also play out here if it's not handled properly within the party. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. But the party cannot afford not to present a candidate in the forthcoming election. So it is doing everything within the modest limit of its capability to ensure that uh, there is sanity, there is understanding, and uh, if uh, possible, then the fresh election will be conducted within a stipulated time, but you within have seven days. But you have equally said, even if, if they say Senator Barcher should step down for peace to reign, he'll be willing to accept that. Or would you advise him to accept that, though? Oh, obviously, if the party prevails and tells him to step down, as a loyal party man, I will advise him to step down. So what is the current situation now? Are the party members meeting? Is the president, I mean, it's, it's the national secretariat summoning or calling all of you to a meeting? What is the position at the moment? Well, the position is that they are equally waiting uh, the, the, the judgment, the certified true copy of the judgment of the Supreme Court for them to spring into action. So mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes, they will wait for that? Obviously, it has to be between today and tomorrow. Otherwise, we will run short of the statutory period for notices because uh, the judgment of the lower court, which has been restored, says that a fresh election should be conducted within 14 days. And seven days' notice should be given 
to the candidates and the public. Mm. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, you're already running short of time. You say that you're still waiting for the certified true copy before you proceed to do, uh, before you proceed to, is it what, to reach out to the candidates? To reach out to the candidate and then maybe if we know the time uh, given by the uh, National Secretariat of our party for the conduct of the election within the stipulated time, then uh, that will not stop us from reaching out to the candidates until because, the last date. Because I'm wondering what has, I mean, if the, the, the judgment of the Supreme Court, you know, is clear, I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get the certified true copy, but knowing that that is the final court of the land, you, you, you cannot read it and say you're going to another court or that anybody is going to go to another court. This is the final uh, judgment of, of the final court of the land. Um, there's no other judgment that's going to be given again. And the, the judgment is clear. Conduct fresh elections. No elections took place within your party, uh, governorship, primaries. Uh, isn't it by now, what precisely are you hoping to achieve by waiting to read the certify or receive the certified true copies before you reach out to the candidates? Well, I, I have to be frank to you. There are divergent opinions about the tenor or the contents of the judgment. Some are saying that uh, the Supreme Court has uh, passed its judgment that there will be no election in Taraba State. In view of one of the reliefs being no, sought. No election or no primary within the APC? No primary election will be condu uh, okay. conducted because one of the, uh, one of the reliefs sought by the plaintiff in the lower court is that the party and the candidate should be delisted by the first respondent, which is INEC. Now, there is no perpetual injunction on that, but the same uh, federal high court went ahead to say you should conduct a fresh election, a primary election, within a stipulated time, 14 days. Now, uh, if it gives that order, and on the other hand, you are saying it should, uh, the, the, the candidate and the party should be delisted, you, he equally sought for damages, refund of his uh, you know, intention um, uh, uh, form, 50 million, and then 8.1 uh, 8 million for other sundry uh, expenses, then one billion naira damages, exemplary damages. But the lower court refused to grant that. It went ahead to give uh, you know, a consequential order that there should be a primary election, which was not requested by the plaintiff then. He cross-appealed. When, when, when the party appealed to the Court of Appeal, he cross-appealed that, look, I want to be compensated. The Court of Appeal, uh, and that the Federal High Court went ahead to give an order which they did not seek for, and they were not given audience to address the, 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 the Federal High Court on the issue of you know, a fresh primary. The respondent then equally cross-appealed. Uh, appealed against that judgment. But the Court of Appeal said, no, the Federal High Court was in order for giving you consequential order. You do, you, you, in fact, you don't have to address the court. And that issue has not been touched by the uh, Supreme Court. So we have to look at the content of the judgment so that we will not do the wrong thing. Because this is why many people also say that, look, with all of these cases that, that went back and forth, that's why many fear that they just may not, your party, it's just a matter of time, that that may not happen. And they thought that by now, that everyone should have just had that meeting, be on the same page, and decide whether or not some of these cases will seek further interpretation. Because, I mean, when they keep going to call for several interpretations, you know, who knows? Uh, would they be seeking, I don't think they'll seek for postponement of the elections because the time has already been predetermined. Is that a major concern for you at all? It's a major concern, but uh, it is not an undoubted issue. Uh, in 2011, 
I contested uh, for election, and uh, my name was removed when it was to be taken to INEC. I quickly went to court. Like tomorrow, the Saturday, the, the election was to take place on, on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And judgment was delivered on Friday that I am the authentic candidate of the, the party. And I was allowed to contest. And I went to the House of Representatives from 2011 to 2015. So you think a similar scenario, even if it's too close to even call, if it you're is still too very close, hopeful? I am very, uh, I, I, I am very sure we can be allowed to contest. But because it, it is the name of the party that is on the ballot. But you know, it's not just about contesting. It's about the opposition as well. You're in the opposition. We have, ruling party we have not stopped campaigning. Our campaign team are going around all the nooks and crannies of Taraba State. So who are they campaigning for? They are campaigning for the party for now. <laughs> yes. no, no candidates for the governorship, just the party? Before just the judgment, the there was a candidate. But as at now, we told them not to stop. They should continue. Just to vote for APC. Don't, there's nothing, there's no candidate you're pushing. This, our candidate is better than this. Obviously, you are voting for the party. You, you, the, the, the first preference is uh, for the party, and then the second, the candidate. It's a very strange campaign. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think so? Oh, because part of the highlight of any campaign is for them to see a candidate. But then you find yourself just going around anyway without a candidate. Obviously, we equally have other candidates. It is not only the governorship uh, candidate. We, ought, we equally have other yeah, but, but in the states... You know, that's the cherry on the cake. Yeah. Well, we, we are campaigning because there is a judgment. You know, you know? I, I'm just wondering, and I've asked you this. You said, oh, you just treat this thing like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, the, I'm neutral. And I tell them that is what the law says. You, I mean, you... You, you try your best to stay neutral, almost like as if you, you stay away, you stay back, waiting for, you know, waiting for the contenders to, you know, contend it amongst themselves. I'm wondering, because if you eventually you're able to conduct fresh primaries, say within the next seven days or, or so, um, usually one of the things that parties like to do is to conclude their primaries on time. So that whatever fallouts come out of it, they're able to manage it and they're able to go into an, an election with a united house, um, how do you think it will affect your chances having primaries so close to an election without room for you to really be able to manage whatever fallout might come out of that primary? The fallout is by the side. The, the, our primary objective is to win the election. And the PDP government in Taraba State, which has been in government since 1999, has already disappointed Tarabans, they are yearning for a change. Tarabans are yearning for a change. Everyone in Taraban knows. So if this election is yours to lose as you're trying to make it out to be, um, the, the thing is we all know that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So if that is the situation, oftentimes when I talk about fallout, I don't just mean people disagree. Oftentimes people go their separate ways as a result of what could happen in a primary. What I'm asking you is how you intend to manage that. Should it happen? Should there, should there be major disagreements as a result of the primaries, as we've seen with this particular primaries that you've held, which matter has gotten up all the way to the Supreme Court? How do you intend to manage that? Well, I don't think that will crop up once there is justice in the conduct of the fresh primaries. Mm -hmm. they are so there was complained. no justice before now? Their complaint is that there was no justice, mm -hmm. there was no fair play. And the Supreme Court has affirmed that. So if a level playing ground mm -hmm. is provided for everybody to participate, and you participated and discovered that you have failed, what reason have you to complain? As chairman, I know you've said you're not the one going to be in charge of conducting the primaries, but what would you be recommending to your party to do so as to avoid the pitfalls that saw, you going to go, saw your members going to court in the first instance? I'm recommending to my party to make sure that the people they will send will give a level playing ground. If efforts to reconcile the contending forces fails, then they should make sure that the election is transparent. Once it is fair and transparent to 
if you lose election and you know that, yes, you have been given the opportunity and all the do's and don'ts have been observed, what reason have you to complain? Unless what, you have other ulterior what motives. What mode would you say they should adopt this time around? Prim uh, indirect or direct primaries? That is within the uh, you know, powers of you can, the It's national. a suggestion. It's a recommendation. Well, my own suggestion would be that we should go for indirect election. Indirect primary election. That, that will be my, if I am asked to give my opinion. That is what how I... How will it suggest? How will it ensure fairness? The delegates are known. You come in. They will be uh, uh, vetted. And then you go and join the line. We have 840 delegates. Five for each ward. Taraba has 168 wards. Time is five. It's 840. So if 840 people come to vote for uh, six aspirants, I mean, the election will be very clear. It will be very transparent. All of them will be in one place. All right. Well, um, uh, at least that is uh, the scenario for now within Taraba APC. So perhaps there could be some high-level meetings also going on amongst the lots to ensure that this is sorted. Thank you for coming on. The Prime Minister, the chairman of APC Taraba State. Lagos politics. That's the next on our agenda. But of course, a lot has been said back and forth. Uh, accusations and counter accusations have been said. But that's just one of a number of things to discuss this morning with Mr. Gwenga Omotosho, who is a commissioner for information in Lagos State. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, the governor didn't attend that uh, much to look forward to. Uh, debate, governorship debate in Lagos. Many people expected he'd be there. And of course, that uh, notice that was put up by government that saying that this is the reason that the government couldn't attend, uh, be at the platform of that debate. But of course, the allegations of violence and attack of uh, one party against the other has been going on and on. We have had a conversation with the PDP here. They said, look, it's all APC and that uh, some members of APC, some thugs, they call them, of APC, hijacked a PDP bus to perpetrate that um, attack on PDP members and all of that. How does government respond to this? <laughs> well, uh, first, uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, everybody knows that uh, the Mr. Biden's old administration is all for peace. If people are saying that they went somewhere in Surulere, and uh, there was an incident there. And they are now putting the blame at the doorstep of the APC, saying that the APC hijacked their vehicle, and then they started shooting there. They are forgotten that uh, this is the age of uh, social media. People were videoing that uh, incident. I myself, I first thought it was a kind of uh, Hollywood uh, movie until uh, I really saw places uh, that we could recognize as Nigeria, and I saw that ah, this is impossible in a city like ours, people shooting in the afternoon without uh, you know, any consideration for people who are around the place. And then uh, I discovered that it's uh, the truth and that it's reality, it's no movie at all. And then the police moved in to get uh, the people who, who did this. And they put out a notice that they were looking for some people at these APC members. These are no APC members. Or well, if uh, people are coming to lie about things that are as glaring as that, I wonder what kind of uh, government they want to be if they uh, unfortunately uh, ever get to power. So I, I think uh, all of the lies uh, that, that have been put out there. How can we really validate that they are not APC members? Because part, part of what uh, the deputy chairman of uh, the opposition party, the PDP in Lagos, said was that look, this has been a build-up that a number of places that they went all over Lagos that they've had that kind of resistance from 
what they call members of the APC. And uh, it's only natural for them to assume, isn't it? Well, if they assume that, they are wrong. But I am telling you the reality. APC members are disciplined. They are, APC is the party of choice in Lagos. APC is the party of the majority in Lagos. APC is the ruling party in Lagos. APC is the party that has been able to show what governance is all about. APC is the party that has been able to show Lagosians dividends of democracy. So why will APC be the one to go and launch an attack against uh, our own people and be chasing them around in broad daylight, shooting as if uh, we are in the days of Shina Rambo or in the days of Uyenusi? I mean, that is not who we are in APC. That is not the kind of uh, Lagos we are building. So what's the position of government on that attack? The position of the government is that the attack must be investigated and whoever is found to have been culpable must be made to face the law. Are you and aware? the police are doing a good job of that. While the security agencies are making their investigations, you know, part of the conversation we had with the PDP yesterday was also about the attack on um, its deputy governorship candidate uh, who happens to be an actress. I would have thought that, you know, um, actresses, you know, of that rating would enjoy goodwill with the people. But she was attacked uh, at a market in Lagos. Uh, she was even rough handled, according to the report. Uh, also, the PDP is saying that uh, ahead of time, traditional rulers are warned not to receive um, their candidate, and that you know, traditional rulers are more like civil servants who answer to the government. So. What's your response to this? If people are trying to denigrate the traditional institution or to deride the traditional institution that they are saying they are appendages of the government, I think it's unfortunate. I think it's uh, nothing that has to do with our culture and tradition. Any attempt to put our culture and tradition down should be condemned by all of us. How can government go and tell traditional rulers who are the uh, owners of their, uh, their, their thrones not to welcome whoever they want to, to welcome. I, I, I think that is uh, absurd and that is, uh, in my own view, uh, uncalled for, for people to be making such uh, allegations. APC has never, as an administration, the one that I work for, the administration of Governor Biden has never told anybody, traditional ruler, or community leader not to receive whoever they want to receive. So if anybody is coming here to make that kind of allegation, I think the person is not telling the truth. And what is going on is that people are playing the victim. You are the aggressor, and yet you are playing the victim. It's an old game that all of us can see through, especially when politicians are their game. But how can they be playing the victim? They say they have evidence of their vehicles vandalized and their members injured. How can they go after their own members? If, if How can they attack evidence, their own deputy governorship candidate? If, if there are any evidence and they feel that uh, the APC is the perpetrator, they should turn such evidence uh, to the police. I, I tell you, should anything happen to any APC member, the first thing that you should do is to go to the police. So if anything happens to them, let them go to the police and the police will investigate. It's not to come on television and begin to make wide and substantiated uh, allegations. If you go to a market and you are off and at the market, the, the, the next place to go is, to, is the police. I do not think uh, that was done by APC people. It's unfortunate if it, if it ever happened because that is not uh, who we are in APC. We want our people not to uh, be violent in any way. And in fact, some of the songs that we sing, they, they, they preach against violence. In Yoruba, they say, if I interpret one in English, they say, don't fight them, just vote. Vote with your PVC. Fight with your PVC. That is the thing that APC is preaching. Not that people should go fiscally and begin to assault And they people. also say, of, of, from all the attacks on them, you know, in uh, Agege, they mention a number of places that they have reported to the police, and the police has done very little in terms of investigation. As the spokesperson of the Lagos State Government here, uh, would you be calling out the security agents? Because I'd like to believe that the security of lives and property, regardless of political affiliation, is your business. So would you be seeing to it that uh, uh, the, the state security agency investigate this and, you know, prosecutes those who are found culpable? That is why we don't even keep quiet when we find this kind of thing. And we don't lay 
and the allegation acquisition at the doorstep of anybody. We call out the police to say this matter must be investigated and speedily so. So it is not uh, that APD is condoning a violence, whoever is perpetrating it. And if anybody accusing APC is just, uh, does not know what he or she wants to say. Mm. Because APC, you cannot, your body puts it, you can't put an elephant on your head. And you begin to scratch the ground for a termite's uh, hole in order to get a termite. APC is the big party. APC is the party everybody wants to beat in Lagos. Mm. So we cannot say because is the majority party in Lagos, everybody loves APC, and APC has shown the world what it can do with development in Lagos, and then we begin to talk about violence. I mean, that is cheap. Okay. Well, but it would seem like government has already decided who perpetrated that activity in Surulere. Would that be correct? Because the governor said, according to the statement the government put out, uh, the, gov the governor will not share the same platform with someone who has perhaps suspected by government. What's the position on government uh, on who perpetrated that If attack? you watch that video, it's quite evident. It's uh, graphic, I mean, visually, you know, penetrating that you can see who and who did what. And that is why the police have put up a notice that they are looking for some people. Because they could be seen there. That's why the fact that they cover their faces, people could recognize them. But and people then, also assume that, that that would have been an, a, a wonderful platform to uh, discredit whoever it is that government suspected did that thing, that gov the governor should have attended that you know, platform, that, 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 that debate, and put, make his own position known that, look, this kind of thing cannot be tolerated by a responsible government. Well, that's not going to be part of the debate, but it was seen on, t uh, on, on that video that uh, you know a party was responsible because of their vehicle that was uh, found there, the signal there. All of the talk about uh, APC hijacking a vehicle and all of that is uh, old women's uh, tales that won't uh, wash at all. And that is why the police are top of the matter and inviting uh, some people. But for the governor to go there, he was ready to go there. Everybody will, you know, attest to the fact that Mr. Sonwolu is not one who will run away from a debate. He's articulate, he's educated, he's highly intelligent, and he knows his onions anytime, any day. And, you know, for him to say that he was not going to go there, we got calls from elders, we got calls from uh, attentive Lagosians, we got calls from uh, uh, intelligent Lagosians who are saying that if this is going on in broad daylight, and the same people who are going to be sitting down with them on the same podium, if they are not. If, if they are this violent, we go on. They could also be violent with their mouth. And you could see what happened there. Someone trying not to be decent, trying to be abusive. I mean, uh, that is not uh, what a debate is all about. Will you, will you be clear about those who are not decent, who are abusive? I mean, you can go back to the uh, video of that uh, event and watch, and you will see them. Okay, abusing but... people who are not even there. So in the future, will the uh, Lagos State government, governor also be you know, shying away from debates because of the same reason? No, not that. If I mean, every debate request, we come with its own uh, values. And if there are values that we share, we will be there. But if uh, people that we are going to be debating with are people who do not respect the lives of Lagosians, they are people who do not uh, feel that they have to be decent, there are people who call it all boys who are trying to become kings. I do not think uh, it will be nice, it will be offending the sensibility of a decent Lagosian for us to be sharing the same platform as that. You know, you know it, it also raises the question of security in the state. Uh, I, I want to believe that the Lagos state government is as concerned as so many other people in the state about the state of security and all of that. Uh, um, robbery in traffic uh, and, and all kinds of unrest occasioned by some of the issues that were not even, you know, uh, initiated by the state government. Fuel scarcity all over the place, uh, robbery in traffic and uh, pockets of other unrest such as that. Uh, looking at these and a number of other insecurity issues that have arisen, there are so many other things that we we'll hope we we'll get to. What are some of those that the Lagos state government has identified and, and how are those issues being addressed, especially 
concerning insecurity? Well, if you talk about uh, security, you will agree with me that there are some things that you cannot wake up 5 a.m. and start coming to the studio. Well, we are talking about in Lagos. Lagos. Yes. In Lagos, you can move around 24 hours, anytime, any day. This is because of the massive investment of Mr. Biden's and Wulu's administration in security. It is because of the collaboration we are getting with the federal government and all security agencies in Lagos that Lagosians can move around. If you are talking about pickpockets, about, uh, you know, people asking you to bring your phone in traffic. These are things that are common in uh, mega cities like Lagos. I've been in New York before. It's even worse. Every second you hear police siren all over the place. But this is not the kind of thing that you will welcome in Lagos. And if you check your records, the traffic robbery thing has gone down. Really, really down. And then when the, the, the Lagos State Security Trust Fund was presenting its reports recently, it was said that... Uh, in the past couple of years, there has been no bank robbery in Lagos. I grew up here, and I know what it used to be. Uh, people uh, moving from one end of the city to the other, robbing innocent uh, Lagosians. But that doesn't happen anymore. Because the security agencies, in my own view, they deserve kudos and not uh, uh, condemnation. But you see, we always you know, looking for the perfect situation, which is very good for us to look for. But honestly, that ID situation it's the one that we are working towards. We are no Lagosian will be afraid of moving around any time, any day. But as we have done, with all the equipment we are giving to the security agencies, the backing we are giving them, I think they have really done well. Mm -hmm. But we live in a society that people talk about uh, their rights and uh, all of the time their privileges. Nobody is talking about responsibility. We usually say that security is the responsibility of all of us. If you hear something, you say something. But that, that also presupposes that government has gone, done some spade work. For instance, uh, if people see stuff, they say stuff to government. One of those things that people say is the indiscriminate parking of commercial buses in places that are not designated as bus stops. Uh, you drove, you know, all the way here to, to our studio, and I'm very sure that you passed through the Berger bus stop. Most of the time, the buses there do not park, they do, they do not use the bus stops that were allotted to them, and that's the scenario all over the city of Lagos. So there are those who are wondering if government expects people to take responsibility, see something and say something. The things that they have seen and said, especially about the, in, the, the indiscriminate um, activities and indiscipline of bus drivers in the city. Government isn't doing anything about it. Well, so if, what's if, next? If, if, what more can we say? If we are talking about security and then we are now moving to how uh, some drivers park on the road. It is how of using you the know you are in Lagos. That, that's Mr. what I'm Robert saying. You know the it's the by. whole thing. It's, it's, it, it doesn't stop. Who knows who is perpetrating these things? Well, what I'm saying is that if drivers, I know that even non-commercial drivers, they do all of these things that you are saying. I mean, instead of you to go into the lay-by, pick up somebody or drop somebody, they just stop on, on, on the road. And they don't know that the 15 seconds, the one minute they are spending on the road, you have uh, this thing tailing back and queues uh, That's why we have you. government. Well, that's that, why we have laws that have to be enforced. You see, I think what, if I tell you the number of people that last my people arrest every day, you will be shocked. And people begin to say that things are hard in town, and then they have been uh, asked to come and pay fines because they have parked in the wrong way and all of that. They, you know, the, the, the thing is that we should talk to ourselves as uh, true Lagosians, as yep. people who are proud to be Lagosians. If the government says, put a sign here, don't not park here, people should not park there. And once you arrest people there, and then they keep on parking there. People will just feel that uh, maybe the government is uh, not uh, doing enough. But I tell you, check out the records of last month. People who have been arrested every day and been given tickets for parking in the wrong place or even driving against one way. The offense in Lagos, you pay with it, you pay, you pay with your car. If you drive against the traffic in Lagos, you lose your car. But despite this, the cars are being auctioned when people are driven against uh, the traffic, people still drive against the traffic. Does that mean government So we is should be able to talk to ourselves instead of putting all the blame on the government. Does that mean we that do, government is overwhelmed? Just a second, it's not sure, sure. Because at the end of the day, it is, government has some responsibilities. Does that mean that government is overwhelmed? I mean, if people are doing the same thing for which many of them have been penalized, 
Does that mean government is overwhelmed? That one other thing that happened just recently, I'm sure you're aware and heartbroken about it, is the, the, the death of nine people uh, just at the footbridge of Ujuelegba. A, a, a bus, a, a, a truck, a trailer truck fell on a bus and killed so many people. And there are those who are wondering, how could such things happen when there are laws that should have been enforced to make sure that lives and property are protected? Well, let me tell you, we have the Lagos Trace uh, Traffic uh, Law 2018. Under that law, the kind of thing that we are talking about uh, is taken care of. The Oju Elegba Bridge, you and I, we agree that uh, there was a time that we had a barrier there. And that barrier was removed because we were asked to remove that barrier. It was removed by the federal authorities who felt it shouldn't be there. But now all of us, we are talking, and we are seeing how we can return that barrier. But let me tell you, very many people have been convicted for the kind of offense that we are talking about. And this particular incident, too, those who are behind it, they are not going to go scot free. They will have their day in court. Recently, people were convicted for driving dangerously and uh, causing the death of uh, other innocent uh, road users in Lagos. So it's not as if the law is quiet on all of these things, but it's not everything that comes onto television that well, you if, do. If you say that uh, so many people are prosecuted um, for such offenses, we wonder why it is not enough to deter further crimes in that regard. But, but let's make progress uh, with the conversation now. The opposition is also calling out the state government, uh, well, be, perhaps beyond this administration, for not uh, delivering dividends of democracy to, to Lagosians uh, with the, compared with the amount of funds that has been available to Lagos State over the years. And it's causing a second look at the account books of Lagos State government. You know, uh, 754 billion naira is what the state government generated in terms of internally generated revenue in the year 2021 alone. And that's besides, you know, the federal allocation that also comes to Lagos. Uh, so what's your response to this? What Lagos has de delivered in terms of infrastructure, is it enough to justify what comes to the coffers of the state government? You see, let me tell you, there is one Yoruba proverb that says that uh, no matter how good a hunter you are, if you kill an elephant, in the presence of your opponent, you cannot kill any big game. The opponent will say, look at the rat, he has killed and he's calling it an elephant. What Lagos is generating and what we have been able to deliver in Lagos, I think we've really, really done well. Because the people who are in charge of uh, our finances in Lagos, from Mr. Governor himself up to the Commissioner for Finance, up to the Commissioner for Planning, these are tested professionals who know the ironies when it comes to the matters of Naira and Kobo. What we are delivering in Lagos is far, far, far exceeds what is coming in in terms of uh, Revenue. Take, for example, just one project like, uh, say, uh, the, the, the Blue Line. All of the housing projects that we have done, about 19 of them, delivering uh, almost uh, 4,000 units of houses in about three years. Or the roads that we have built, 970 roads. Or opening 15 schools in one day on October, October 19 last year. Or building four mother and child hospitals in about three years. On all the big, big projects that we are doing, and anybody who is saying that uh, the kind of money Lagos is making, that what we have done is not uh, justifiable, I think the person is just uh, being uh, cynical. The person is just uh, being uh, unrealistic. And the person is, uh, you know, in, uh, in many cases, lacks uh, facts and figures, which uh, we will give them any time, any day. Lagos is a very big uh, city of about 25 million people. So to cater for these 25 million people, you need a lot of money. And there is no state that can go and do the kind of projects that we are, we, we are doing now because they can't even raise the funding. So for us, it's not just the kind of money that Lagos is making from federal authorities or taxes. Out of 25 million people, about 6 million are in the tax slate. And of those 6 million, about 4.2 million are active taxpayers. You and I who pay through our offices. Most of the big men you see in town and all the other people in about 25 million people, they don't pay any tax. And any day, I mean, look at how states were flooded recently in Taraba, in Anombra, in so many other places. You do not, we didn't experience that kind of thing in Lagos. 
because of the kind of money government has spent on drainage. And drainage is not something you can see. But if you are talking about brick and mortar, I'm telling you, 19 housing projects in about three years. You know, 1,047 school projects in about three years. I mean, iconic schools like Elemoro, iconic schools like uh, Vetland Grammar School, and yet they will say they have not seen anything. These are things that even the blind can feel. These are things that the deaf can One see. One of those that you mentioned is the Blue Line project, and uh, amid that is the on, on Lagos Ibadu Expressway is the ten lane expansion that has taken you know, more than a decade to complete. It started uh, during the administration of former governor and now Minister of Works, Babatunde Fashola. Why has that taken so long? If Lagos has you know access to such a you know humongous amount of funds in terms of IGR um, um, uh, federal allocation. If you look at what Lagos is carrying, what we have is not among us at all. But first, let me just correct the impression that Lagos is bad and Expressway is a Lagos a project. Lagos, uh, it's a federal government uh, project. Uh, Lagos Badagri Expressway. Lagos Badagri Expressway, the side of uh, Lagos Badagri Expressway that concerns Lagos is almost completed. The other side is the federal side, which uh, uh, our honorable minister has said that uh, uh, he is going to ensure that it's completed. And as I speak with you now, Contractors are working there. But go to the kind of a road that we, we, we opened about uh, two days ago, the uh, uh, Eleko Junction to uh, Equity T -T Junction. That's a road that was built 42 years ago, which uh, the administration of Mr. Baideson will has now turned into a six lane highway, lit, rigid concrete uh, pavement, with all the facilities that you can see, world class road. I mean, why would somebody not talk about that? Mm -hmm. When okay. they now drive to a and they get to a in a few minutes, they will know that uh, we have done something. But, but there are so many other feeder roads in other parts of Lagos that belie, you know, your account of uh, your, the funds being justifiable for what you have provided Lagos has, over the years. Lagos has about 9,400 roads. There is no way you can fix all of them in three years. It's not possible. We have done 970 roads. Lagos Public Works Corporation has done 650 roads as of November. By now, they must have done more. If you go to Facebook or any part of the social media, you see Lagos State Public Works Corporation working day and night. Nowadays, they don't sleep. They work day and night because they want to do a lot before the rains come. But you see, if they haven't got into your area, just calm down, they'll be there. Okay, well, Mr. Motosho, we're winding down now, and I'm just wondering. So, one of the funny issues that a number of people have been concerned about is the disappointment that Lagos State, for instance, is one of those states that didn't say yes to the Lagos, uh, to the local government autonomy, uh, financial and administrative autonomy. Is there a reason for that? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the job of the uh, House of Assembly to say yes or no. Well, I, and I, they I... went around. I think what is done in that kind of thing is that when you present a bill, especially a public bill like that, they go out and sample opinions. They do uh, what they call a public uh, uh, assessment. People will come and say whatever they like, a kind of town hall meeting over such a bill. And I think the position of Lagos State uh, House of Assembly, uh, which was uh, presented uh, by the government, is uh, what they got from their constituencies. Well, what is the position of the government, the executive arm of government, about the autonomy? Because one would expect that if the uh, local government system was autonomous, some of the burden that Lagos State government is carrying would, have, would, would, would be, the government would be assisted by these 57 local governments and LCDs all over the place. And some of the thorny issues of uh, pockets of insecurity here and there would have been dealt with at that level. Well, let me, let, me, let me tell you something. When they are talking about local government autonomy, I think what really sparks social talks is about uh, finances. Lagos is uh, one of the very few states where nobody touches local government money. Local government money goes to the local governments directly. It has nothing to do with state government. So if the uh, Lagos State is presenting a case that uh, the House of Assembly in Lagos doesn't uh, uh, accede to the proposition that uh, there should be local government autonomy, it's something that has to do with the lawmakers, the Assembly, and their constituents, not 
the same government. Because the same government has nothing to do with local government money. Just to clarify, Mr. Motosha, did you say that uh, the position of the State Assembly was based on views collated from constituents? I'm just seeing how the process works. This particular one... So by one, constituents, do you mean the people at the grassroots? Yeah. They the will, people they, at the grassroots? Yes, because they will go around and talk to they their They would people. vote against local government autonomy? That may have happened. Okay. I, I wasn't part of the process. <laughs> well, we, we could go on and on about this, and let's hope that the Lagos State House of Assembly will be able to guest us on this program as well uh, to talk about that and a number of other things. But we have to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ibenga Omotosho, Lagos State Commissioner for Information Strategy. Thank you so much, and all the best all the time. Thank you. Well, that is Sunrise Daily this morning. I assume that we have a number of uh, comments coming from you, your own contribution to the program. Let's begin with this one by uh, Professor Enachena, who says, politics has become a recompense to sophistry, packed with vitriolic arguments done to create maelstrom on the minds of voters to circumvent the real issues at stake. Corruption is stifling the economic growth of our nation. Voters must be vigilant this time. And this one from Uluwa Shewo JME says, CBN must make the new Naira notes available for all before the 25th of February general election because people might sell their votes for 1,000 Naira if this hardship persists. God bless Nigeria. Amen to that. Well, yeah. Chamberlain, I'm giving you the third one. Okay, I'm going to read the last yeah, two. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, uh, Festus Fista Akimboyewa said, no doubt the decisions behind the change of our currency are good, but the chaos we're seeing shows the timing is pretty tough. Poor Nigerians who are already struggling to make ends meet are the ones being hit the most. Time to bring out the cash. And well, that's from Festus Akimboyewa <laughs> and Joseph of Arimathea. Very interesting name. Yeah. Says, if you wish to eliminate mosquitoes and it's standing on your balls, what it requires is wisdom. The intention of CBN is good, but the timing can trigger an uproar among the masses. Our infrastructure doesn't support quickly implementation of such policy. Wisdom. Uh, that's the advocacy of Joseph of Arimathea this morning. Oh, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea in the Bible was a very wise man, so um, not surprising. Thank well, that's all right. we'll have to leave it this morning, I guess. Well, yes, indeed. So we'll look to see how this plays out in, over the weekend and the week ahead. That's the show today. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain, so goodbye. Well, we'll see you next week where we begin to have three hours for you in the morning. It's going to be extended even as we move into the elections. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Here's wishing you a weekend of good fortune. Hopefully you see a little more of the new Naira notes. Thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. And in all that getting, get thy PVC. Am I your marketing day? Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. <laughs>